We've been going through this series in Philippians, a master class in joy. As we've seen, Paul is writing while under house arrest in Rome, right? He's waiting for his time to appear before Nero. More than likely for two years, he's under house arrest. Given his circumstances, the sense or the assumption of what this letter would be about um, would probably be one of a bit of heaviness, a bit of, man, Paul must really be having a hard time as he's facing what he's facing, just based on his circumstances. And yet, as we've started in this series, and as we'll continue, we'll see the overwhelming message of Philippians is joy. Regardless of your circumstance, there is joy sourced in our relationship with the Lord. There is joy found in knowing him. There is joy found in being part of his mission. Uh, there's joy in the faith. There's joy in community and partnership with him. A couple of weeks back, we heard how there's joy in sharing the gospel. Um, Last week as Donnie brought the message talking about um, with the famous verse, to live is Christ, right? And we saw Paul lives that out by actually considering the faith and joy of his brothers and sisters in Christ more important than maybe what he would want to do if the choice was just left to him alone to make of how to live his life. And that's part of living for Christ. As we enter into the last few verses of chapter one today, um, we're going to read through this passage. We'll be in Philippians 1, 27 through 30. I'm reading from the NLT this morning um, because the NLT highlights uh, a translation right off the bat that I think is really, really important to the rest of the passage. And so we're going to read through this to get started and then take some time to actually press into this verse by verse. If you have your Bibles, you can open or you can read along with me on the screen. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Paul says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Just as he started this letter with a note on identity, referring to the believers as saints, uh, that in Christ you are a saint in his kingdom, he comes back again to go back to this idea of being citizens, that you have a new identity in your walk with the Lord. He says, If you understand that, then, whether I come to you and see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. Right? If we understand who we are as God's people, together we will be united in the purpose for which God has called us, as one people, fighting for the gospel. In verse 28, he says, Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. Now, Paul never defines who these enemies are exactly. Like, he doesn't go into great detail. A couple of weeks back, Don Partain shared that there was some internal rivalry within the church, right? There were other preachers who were um, just building up division and rivalry between themselves and Paul. And we don't think he's talking about them here based on the next verse. Um, More than likely, it's uh, enemies of something happening with those outside of the church. Um, This could be Judaizers, throughout Paul's ministry as he would share this message of the gospel of grace that we are saved through faith in Jesus, there would be men who grew up in the Jewish tradition who would follow behind and say, okay, well, yes, but also to be saved, you still have to follow all the rules of the law. So salvation is grace plus your obedience and your behavior. So there's potential for that. There's potential that this is just Roman authority. Right As the Christian faith, as the way is growing and more and more people are coming to follow it, that can be seen as a threat to those who are ruling. Right? Are these people going to cause dissension? Are they going to cause something that would uh, try to go against our authority in our own land? Um, Or honestly, it could just be Philippians around the city, right? As people are coming to faith in Jesus and the way in which they're living and their lives are changing, it's upsetting the status quo, as it often does. So, We really don't know. There's not clarity in this passage, but what Paul says next is kind of the most important thing, regardless of who the enemy might be. He says, don't be intimidated. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed and that you are going to be saved by God himself. This reminder that a steadfast faith, responding rather than fire with fire to opposition, but peace in knowing who God is and what he has called us to um, (laughs) will actually turn out to be a witness and will turn out to prove all the more that where we stand in our faith with the Lord is actually true and it's real. And we stand for a God who is real and is true. 
towards the end here, he says, um, for you've been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Sometimes that word suffering uh, causes a bit of resistance or a bit of tension in our souls as we hear that word. So we'll press into that. What is that referring to? And then in verse 30, the last thing he says in this passage, we are in this struggle together. You've seen my struggle in the past and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Three times he talks about togetherness, standing together, fighting together, struggling together. Reminding us once again the irreplaceable place of community in the Christian faith. So let's pray together and we're going to press into each of these verses. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. Holy Spirit, we thank you that as we read your word, your spirit is working to bring to light those things that we need to hear most. Those things which are most important for our own faith with you, Lord, and, and our faith as a church and our witness to the world. As God, well, we pray that you would lead this time. We pray for encouragement where we are discouraged. We pray for conviction where we are complacent. We pray that you would be glorified, God, that we would know you more and live for you more because of the time that we can share together today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'll jump back into verse 27. Again, here Paul says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. He says, above all. In other words, of most importance. Don't miss this. Take this to heart. This is crucial for your faith. And he says, you must live as citizens of heaven. You must understand your identity in Christ. This is a foundational piece. For me, I I right away relate this to um, the world of building, construction, carpentry. Um, And maybe some of you are familiar with that world. Maybe some of you have had some remodel or work done on your home. If you live in Missoula, you've probably had remodel or construction work done around your home uh, with the way things are right now. But the very first thing that is addressed is the foundation. You can build a beautiful home. You can spend a fortune on a home. If it is not built on a solid foundation, it will eventually have issues and will cause trouble. This is so true of our faith. If we try to just build our faith, if we try to just do the things that we're supposed to do, without a foundation of identity and understanding of who God is and what he has done, and because of that, who he has made us to be, eventually, as we try to just live the Christian life without a foundation, there will be issues. We will run into struggles. We will face some hardships that cause our house to to crumble or give way. I think it's important, too, that as a foundation is built, oftentimes there is a taking away of things that cause a poor foundation. And of bringing in, kind of like God's spirit, of what will create a good foundation. You will have no idea how to live until you know who you are, or better, whose you are. This is a truth of the Christian faith. And Paul uses this word, citizens, in some translations it just says, live in a way or walk in a manner worthy. Um, But there's, there's a specific word that from the Greek is translated citizen. And it's really, really important because I think Paul was really intentional in the reason for using it. If we remember back, right, Philippi was a Greek city conquered by Rome. When Rome would conquer nations, they would give different standings uh, to those nations they conquered, kind of based on what benefit that nation would bring them often or how it would best help that nation become part of the Roman Empire. And so there was different statuses or authority they could give. Philippi was given full status as a Roman colony. This meant that if you were born in Philippi, you, you became a Roman citizen, right? And all the rights and privileges that came along with that. This was a source of pride for the Philippians, right? So Paul... He's he's using language to connect their understanding of their identity as Roman citizens with the privilege and pride of being connected with God's people as citizens of heaven. I think Colossians 1, 11 maybe says it best in a few verses of this identifying with Christ and what God has done for us. In Colossians 1, starting verse 11, 
Paul, again, writing here, says, May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. What this verse and what we'll see throughout the scripture is, is a heavy emphasis on understanding our identity. And I think a few things that our culture gets wrong about identity is where we find it. We hear terms like uh, self-made man or make something of yourself, right? This idea that you can go out and make up an identity for yourself. <laughs> or that identity is found, right? I need to go find myself. I need to find meaning and purpose in my life. But what we actually see is that Identity is something that is bestowed, meaning it's something you have to receive. And we live this out in our everyday lives. Based on where you were born, based on your family, based on the relationships you're in, based on the culture of where you work and where you find yourself, you're all the time having identity placed on you. And you're forming an identity out of that. And what God is saying is that you have been rescued from a kingdom of darkness and transferred into his kingdom. So whatever identity you once had, you have now been offered a new identity. And any pieces of your old identity that come into opposition with the identity you have in Christ needs to be thrown to the wayside. Uh, We have some family. Um, This was some time ago now, but they were doing missions work overseas. Due to some of the challenges and some of the uh, local economic and government that was going on, they eventually had to come back home. But in their time there, they had grown a great love for the people they were serving. In particular, they had grown a deep love for for three young kids um, that when when they had first met them at this point, they were orphans. Um, So these kids who once lived in horrible conditions, um, a destructive home uh, where they experienced sickness, malnourishment, all kinds of abuses, had been rescued out of that, and then in the process of some of our family who, again, came home from missions, they adopted these kids and brought them home with them, right? And so it's such a beautiful picture that we see in Scripture of being transferred from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light, right? Where they were adopted into a new home where they were cared for and loved and provided for. But as time passed, as they were getting acclimated and used to their new home and a new family and all these things, um, all three of these kids kept suffering from severe stomach issues, like just severe pain that would hit them. And the family couldn't figure out what was causing it. All right, so they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to figure out uh, what, what could possibly be causing it. It eventually led to where they took them to have them checked out by a doctor, wondering if, man, did they bring up like, some sort of sickness or parasite back with them that's affecting them? We can't figure it out. So the doctors look at them. There's no medical explanation. They don't, they don't have any sickness. They don't have anything that's in their bodies that's causing this. So the family's still trying to figure out what what could be causing this. And they start taking a little closer look at just the home and the environment and all the places the kids are. Is is there an allergy? What could this be? They can't figure it out. But one thing they did realize over time is that food from the pantry, from the cabinets, from the fridge, just kept going missing. And as they're talking with each other, they're like, well, I, I didn't take anything and you didn't eat anything, so where is it going? They come to find that these kids are taking food anytime they can and sneaking away and then eating it. In fact, overeating to the place of getting themselves sick. Right? They came from a place where they didn't know when their next meal would come. So if they got food, they would eat like it was their last. So now they're in a new home where everything is provided for them. They have an abundance of food and they're still living like they're in their old way of life and in their old home. Even though they've been given everything they have everything they need. And then what, what a picture of our Christian life. How often do we do the very same thing as believers? Right? That we have been given a new identity in a new home, in a new kingdom. We are citizens of heaven, yet often we act like citizens of earth. We still live in fear like we are all alone and have to take care of ourselves. We don't only identity that Christ has given us in that 
we are now his and he will provide everything we need. And this is exactly what Paul is getting at with the Philippian believers. You live in a new kingdom with a new king. Stop living like you are still in the old kingdom of this world. Who we are informs how we live. Who we think we are (laughs) informs how we live. So church, as we consider ourselves, do we live in a manner that reflects that we are God's? That we are his children, citizens of his kingdom? The scriptures are chocked full of examples of what kind of life this new identity produces in us. In fact, the very next verse gets into it, or the very second half of that verse, actually. In verse 27, Paul continues, he says, Then whether I come see you again or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together for the faith, which is the good news. This reality that as we come together as citizens of heaven, united in God's family, we are given a new vision a new purpose, sharing in the faith. We come under a new king who is so worthy of our life, we can, like Paul say, to live as Christ. The crazy thing is, there is no man-made vision, there is no human-sourced campaign or purpose for your life that is big enough and great enough to draw all people from all places of all different backgrounds and ages and race. There is only one king big enough. There's only one kingdom great enough to draw in people from every place. Our king is not like the kings of this earth. He is a king of goodness, of compassion, of justice, of grace, of truth, of love, where kings of this world use their people for their own whim and to fill their own desires. Our king came to serve, to redeem to bless, to share his kingdom with us. And a king like this allows us to throw off any selfish ambitions we might have. Because usually that's what gets in the way of unity. At At some place along the way, what I desire and what you desire conflict. Unless we are both pursuing something bigger and greater than each one of us could bring to the table. And so, (laughs) when we come to the kingdom of God, we can burn our earthly kingdoms to the ground and align ourselves with his. Um, Which was something that first century people understood. That coming to faith in Jesus meant a giving off of my old life and aligning myself with the king, Jesus. Jesus. But I don't know that in Western America, Western church, we always take that into consideration Um, in the moment, maybe, that we come to know the Lord. But there is a point where every Christian has to ask themselves, whose kingdom takes priority in my life? Is it his kingdom or will it be my kingdom? And that will shape so many of the choices we make day to day. Paul goes on in verse 28, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that you are going to be saved, even by God himself. Again, because you are citizens of heaven, you don't need to be intimidated by the authorities or powers of this earth. Rather, (laughs) because your kingdom is unmovable, you can stand unmovable in whatever that is, struggle, suffering, challenges that we face, because we stand with the king who will not be moved. And the crazy part about that is that so often the way in which we endure opposition or challenges in our life actually ends up being a witness to those around us. Have you ever noticed that? Like, when everything is fine in our life and we're just going along, there isn't always as noticeable things about our lives that are different. But then when there's loss or challenge or grief, man, it draws attention. How are we going to react in those moments? How do we respond in the midst of that? It shows the reality of who Christ is and what faith in Christ can do in our lives in a tangible way. I mean, I would encourage those of you who are facing opposition to your faith, um, 
whatever that might look like. And it, it looks different for us in Missoula, Montana than, than it did for the believers in the first century. We won't pretend that it was the same, but whatever the difference is, it's still opposition. I think one of the most important things we see throughout scriptures, in times of trials and struggles, there's, there's often a reminder of the hope that we have. Right, that regardless of what you're facing now, there is a hope in Christ that is sure. And what enables us to move forward in the midst of that is that we know the end of the story. God wins. Christ said it is finished when he was on the cross. This allows us to enter into confidence even when the circumstances around us would give us no confidence for what we're facing. Imagine a soldier going off to war, already knowing the outcome of what he's about to face. There's no doubt whether or not there will be a victory. He still has to stay in the fight. There is still work to do in the midst of it, but there is a confidence because he knows the end. Right? I can relate this more easily to uh, running, for those of you who are runners. Um... There's days where you go for a run and you just, you ate bad the day before or you didn't sleep well or the run itself is particularly hard, right? You get some good mountains around Missoula or it's just really long. Um, like you ultra marathon runners, marathon wasn't enough. So we're going to say ultra marathon runners. You people are sick. I don't know <laughs> what is wrong. With I enjoy running. I will not do that. Um, but if you've had a bad day or a particularly hard run, there's a point, at least for me, where just mentally, all I can do is think about the next step. Like, it's just enough mentally to, to make myself take the next step. I'm running on, on basically preserving myself enough just to make it and hoping I'll make it. Right? And so that's how you're running, like, with reserve in every step. But if you round a corner or you get over the top of that ridge, um, or you come down and you see the parking lot in sight, or you see the finish line if you're in a race, what happens when you can see that parking lot or that finish? You run. Why? What has changed in your circumstances? Nothing. But now, both mentally, emotionally, and actually physically, you know you are going to finish this race. It is in the bag. It is, it's finished in your mind. So mentally and emotionally, all of a sudden, you can just put everything into that bit of the race and run it wholeheartedly, leaving nothing back. Man, that's a picture of our Christian life. Rather than running with reserve, with worry of, man, what's the next step going to be? Because we know the end is sure, we can run with abandon. Verse 29 continues, For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Now, on this note of suffering, we're not going to spend too much time in it actually today because we're going we're to meet it a few more times through the book of Philippians. Suffering is a theme throughout the biblical narrative. Um, but I think it's really important we understand that suffering is a universal human experience. Because of sin, because of fall, suffering is in our world. It, you, you can't get away from it. You can't escape it. You can't try to avoid it. One man said, you are as likely to live and avoid suffering as you are to live and avoid breathing. It's just part of the life we live here. The difference in what is unique to the Christian is that suffering can produce life in and around us. Because of Christ's presence, there is redemption to our suffering. Timothy Keller says, Jesus Christ did not suffer so that you would not suffer. He suffered so that when you suffer, you'll become more like him. The gospel does not promise you better life circumstances. It promises you a better life. So whatever struggle, opposition, challenge you might be facing, the Lord in his goodness can work it for something really beautiful and life-changing in you and around you. few other things that the scriptures tell us about um, suffering and how it's a privilege to suffer. 
Jesus, in Matthew 11, actually, said, Blessed are you, blessed, (laughs) are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In Acts 5, we see after Jesus has died, rose again, and ascended into heaven, right? His disciples start to share the good news, the gospel, around Jerusalem. um, And they face some opposition from that. And the Jewish leaders do the same thing. They keep doing time and time after a day. They've been doing time and time again. They arrest these men. They beat these men. They bring them back and say, okay, you need to quit talking about this or something worse is going to happen, essentially, in a nutshell. Read Acts 5. It's a really awesome story. But in Acts 5.41, in response to this, it says, the apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Worthy to suffer. Man, so the question is, what, what makes men and women rejoice in suffering? What makes people count it a privilege to suffer for Christ? And not to oversimplify it, but to be honest, it is simple. They experienced the person of Jesus. They came to see how worth and worthy Jesus is. Right? The sacrifice is worth it because Christ is worth it. There is no life apart from Jesus. There is no joy apart from Jesus. There is no purpose. There is nothing greater than the person of God himself. And so, as I come to know that in an experiential way, in a personal way, the idea of saying, okay, there will be suffering in my pursuit of Jesus is a worthwhile risk. We see this time and time again throughout Scripture. And I think, man, for, <laughs> for those of us who maybe still... Uh, the idea of reconciling, well, I want to follow God but not suffer, um, you're not going to find it. But as you know the person of Jesus Christ more and more, the worry and fear of suffering will dissipate. And I would just encourage you, man, if that, if that is a, the social um, suffering or whatever it might cost you to follow Jesus, to you seems hard to, to pay, man, you got to get to know Jesus more. He's really, really worth it. Hands down. Um, so, church, how have you recently experienced God in your life in a personal way? Specifically, how have you recently experienced how holy and worthy the person of Christ is in your life? Verse 30 goes on. We are in this struggle together. Thank you, Jesus. Um, You have seen my struggle in the past and you know that I am still in the midst of it. Here again, three times this word together, this theme of partnership, of community together is in this passage. The reality that as we face struggles, we're not alone. We are part of the family of God and his kingdom to face it with one another. And here's the cool part, that as we stand and fight and suffer together, we deepen in our faith. I mean, right as I just said, that if this idea of struggling or suffering is hard for you to want to face, you need to press it into your relationship with God, right? You need more time in communion with God, but you also need more time in the community of God because you are meant to face it with others. And as we pursue after Christ together, united in that, we actually grow more deeply in our faith. There is um, a picture of community throughout the scriptures that brings such a depth to what it means to stand in faith together. Right, to stand and fight and struggle together is so much more than coming together on a Sunday morning. It's so much more than attending Sunday morning and being part of a life group. There, there's a deep sense of, man, we're, we're sharing life, not a couple meetings a week together. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul writing says, we love you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. 
right, that we share lives with one another, praying together, meeting together, working together, <laughs> learning the scriptures together, raising kids together, facing hardship together, weeping together, worshiping together, witnessing together, celebrating together, and struggling together. Community is the place where the truth of who you are meets the grace of who God is in a tangible way. Right? There's, there's this reality that takes place in community as we seek the Lord together that cannot happen apart from it. I often think of, even, even just in your own walk with the Lord, consider ways in which you have come to know the Lord in a deeper way based on someone else's story or example of their life. How the Lord met them in a unique way. And maybe you didn't quite have that kind of experience with God, but you had your own experience with God and how both of you sharing those experiences together actually gave you a fuller picture of who God is. That's the idea that we're getting at here. That the full picture of God, the great picture of God, for the Christian's life is often like a a puzzle, a magnificent puzzle, but a puzzle where each one of us brings a piece to the table. And the more pieces we add to that puzzle, the fuller and clearer the picture of God is that we get to view. That's how it is in our own life. That's how it is in our witness. That's how it is in the Christian walk. And so we need to experience communion with God and the community of God. And if I'm honest, I would challenge that. I, I don't know that the majority of us are experiencing that in the church. Um, Not the kind of community we see. There's this picture in the scripture that isn't quite meeting with the reality we're facing. And there can be a lot of reasons for that, right? I'll admit a few of the reasons why I don't always experience that kind of community. For me, I'm often too busy, too closed, too independent, too jaded to risk the vulnerability it requires to live in that kind of community. And and I think for many of us, us missing out on that kind of community is starting to take its toll on our faith. And I mean that just in general for the American church. I think it has taken a toll on the American church, the lack of depth of community that we are sharing with one another. And perhaps in Missoula, perhaps at Mac being willing to, to take the risk to press into that kind of shared life together is so worth it. But it does take a risk. It does take some vulnerability. It does take some reprioritizing of our own lives and our own agendas. So church, what keeps you from participating in deeper community? And how would your life look different? How would your faith look different if you had this kind of community in your life? Right, understanding that as citizens of heaven and our understanding of being citizens of heaven is intricately connected with our communion with the Lord and our community with one another. Worship team, if you want to come on up. As we close our time, um, we're going to jump back to verse 27 just for a moment because we kind of spoke to half of that verse and then kind of jumped over a, a sentence there and... Um, He said, Paul said to them, as citizens of heaven, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. I think so often as we consider those kind of words, conduct yourself in a manner worthy, um, we are so prone to jump back into the idea of, okay, I need to do more now. I need to get my life together. I need to look more Christ-like. Right? And so we, we try to build, the, build our life, our faith, off of this idea of, well, I just got to pull it together rather than, well, if the foundation in Christ has been set, what does it look like now to just let him continue to build this house? Do we understand that it is God who made us citizens of heaven? Do we uh, understand that us being invited into God's family it was not done because we did something to deserve it? We are invited, we are enabled to be citizens of heaven because of what God has done and because of his heart and character for us. That God is so rich in mercy. He is so full of grace. 
He purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. He enabled us to share in his life and kingdom. He is the one who is fully worthy and we are unworthy. And you guys, that's, that's again kind of the point to so much of our Christian walk. That again is the gospel. We don't bring anything to the table in our walk with the Lord. It starts with what he has done. By grace we have been saved. We enter into the kingdom not because we earned it, but because he offers it to us freely. And then once we're in the kingdom, we are not paying it off. We're not now acting more like God because that's what we need to do. We are (laughs) living out our identity because we've understood of God's great grace and the work that he's done in our lives. We stop trying to make ourselves worthy, but as we consider how worthy he is, it brings us to this place of surrender. It brings us to this place where we can fully, wholeheartedly (laughs) run with abandon. And let God have complete work, complete kingship in our lives. And when we do that, he joyfully takes us. He, t- he shapes us into his own people. People whose life reflect their identity as citizens of heaven, whose lives begin to look and live in a manner worthy of his gospel. So church, as we end with worship, Consider the reality that we are made worthy as we surrender our lives to the one who is worthy of all of our life. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, God, for how good you are. God, I pray that in this time, in this space, you would show us by your spirit, Lord, areas of life where we need to surrender to you, Lord. God, areas of our life where we are still trying to live like we're on our own, like we're living in the world rather than as your people. Areas of our life, Lord, that we are resisting surrender to you. Areas where we need to get to know you more, God. We need to see your worth more clearly, your goodness, (laughs) that you are so, so good to us, God. And so, Lord, with that, we commit this time to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.